Okay, so this is Friday, end of the third week, for which we're all grateful. Uh, secondly, this is the last lecture I have scheduled for magnetics. So I have a fair number of things to get through. Uh, I'm going to be flipping through slides pretty quickly because a lot of them you can just uh, go ahead and look at yourselves. Uh, there's one or two things that I think are important. It'll take a little bit of time to go through. I'm going to concentrate on those. The, in particular, they have to deal with your TBL on um, trying to understand how we can look at the signatures from a, from a buried pipe. So that's, that's the technical thing of significance. Uh, and the rest of this, I want to just go through quickly. So from the point of view of data processing, there's really only two things that are important. Uh, one is removing you know, the uh, Earth's magnetic field and the, and the, time, the time variations. And that, for that, we had uh, established a base station, so you did that uh, at, the, at the beach. And the other is removing regional trans. So I'm going to just flip through these guys, and then we'll get on to uh, the regional trend. So time variations, externally, internally, lots of stuff happening from the sun, uh, local things with you know generators and uh, various kinds of infrastructure noise. Uh, but the main thing is what's happening, you know, from the uh, from the solar system. <coughs> time variations uh, can be anything from uh, minutes to hours to, to days, anything from hundreds of nanoteslas to thousands of nanoteslas. So we uh, have, have got a lot of variations. And what we do is we uh, generate a base station, measure the magnetic field at the base station as a function of time, synchronize with our receiver that we're collecting the data with, and then perform the correction by subtraction. So that was the time variations we've done that before. The, the other dip, uh, aspect of processing is that we're measuring uh, data in the presence of the Earth's field, as well as you know we're interested in you know something of a scale size like this, and th and there might be some big object out over here that's just adding a big signal to this, and and we really. We really don't care about this guy. We're not trying to find him. So at this perspective of looking at this scale length, uh, this guy over here is big geologic noise, and we want to try to get rid of him. So what we're going to do is, we're in general, what we'll have is like some kind of a signature. So here is like maybe one of those from the dipole. And, and that's superposed upon some bigger, large scale field. We're going to call this thing the regional field. So that's that's sort of that background field. And here is our anomalous field that we want. And we need to separate these two things. It's not a trivial matter, but we're somehow going to try to estimate what this background is. And then we're going to subtract it from the observations. And then we're going to be left up with a residual field that looks like this. And then we're going to say, ah, that's our anomalous field. And I'm going to try to uh, in in interpret that. So that's the goal. Uh, how we do this is actually not a trivial operation. And it depends upon what you consider to be the scale of interest for you. For instance, if Here's a big object. If I'm interested, if my observation plane is over here, then this guy is actually part of what I'm looking for, right? If he's sitting out over here and he's causing a big distortion to the field, then he's not. <coughs> so it's a matter of deciding what scale you're looking at and then trying to decide, okay, what is that background field? And that takes, uh, that you know, we could do some things that are numerical but there's also some subjectivity that's, uh, that, that's involved. And in fact, you could see that if I didn't have this dashed line here, and if I asked everybody to draw you know, some kind of a background field, you can see that some people might draw something that looks like this, you know, so it might go up into here, or some other direction. So separating that, drawing that regional field is not a trivial operation. 
And to emphasize this, uh, this is uh, an area in British Columbia. It, it has the Mount Milligan deposit, which I've mentioned a couple times, but it is one of the most recent mines to go into production, it's the Crocker Porphyry deposit. This is a magnetic map. Red is high uh, magnetics. Blue is low. So this is 65,000 nanoteslas. This is 57,000. So there's, uh, you, you know, 8,000 nanoteslas difference between high and low. What you're seeing up here, this region up here, it's, it's, it's Mount Milligan, right? This is a mountain. A lot of magnetic material in, in, in here. And the magnetic map is really, you know, completely overwhelmed by just this, you know, great big high and gradually getting to, getting to a low. Turns out that's not what is of interest. What's of interest is this region in here, in this box. And if you look at just that region, you know, you can see it kind of dominated by this, this red part in here, which is all part of the mountain. So that's not, that's not what we're trying to get here. We're, we're trying to get magnetic signature in this region that might just be uh, reflective of this uh, mineral deposit underneath. So what we have to do is to take this large scale map. We try to estimate what the smooth background regional field is. We subtract that from the data, and then we're left with something that looks like this. So what we see here, it's a blown up part of what this inset was. It's the result of having taken that initial data, estimating the background, subtracting it. And now you can see what we've got. So we've got a high magnetic anomaly here, and a high magnetic anomaly there. And now we could take these data, go ahead and invert them, and come up with something that uh, is more useful. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the basic scenario. We're not going to go into details about how we do that, but basically for every magnetic survey that you're going to do, you're going to get rid of these time variations, and then you're also going to try to somehow get rid of some background so that in the end, you're left with an area over which you've taken data, and it's just all reflective of some local objects underneath here. And so you can think about this as the anomalous field due to, due to these types. Uh, OK, so now uh, I, I just want to present a couple of examples of magnetic data, and then we're kind of going to go through how we might uh, might think about this. So this we already talked about. This guy we've seen before, but uh, now you recognize that each of these, uh, you know, is a pattern due to you know, a magnetic dipole that is situated in in different directions, and that uh, you now also understand that these signatures are coming in a large part from remnant magnetization. So we want to go ahead and make some, uh, so we processed our data, got our maps, whatever, and now we want to actually make some inference from those, uh, the data images. Uh, yeah, so this I don't think I need to say very much. The, the problem with making direct inferences from the data is that you know, we saw if you take the same object, you bury it in different locations in the Earth, then you get different results. So it makes it really difficult. One of the uh, processing techniques that you will see, and I'll show you an example of, is called reduction to pole. When you look at a magnetic map, they'll all they'll sometimes have the, the signatures RTP, reduction to pole, that's sitting underneath there. And what it means is essentially the following. The easiest thing to really interpret 
okay, is the following situation where I've got, you know, some kind of an object that's sitting here, a magnetic field that's coming in like this, and now I've got an anomalous field like this, and if I plotted it out, I would have, you know, an anomaly that looks like this, so that if I looked at the high point of the anomaly, dug straight down, I'd see it. So that's what's happening here. So this was the case when you, like, suppose you had that little prism, and you have an inclination of 90 degrees, and you look at the total field uh, anomaly, you, you see that it's nicely centered right above the object. Great. That's a no-brainer, right? You look at it, like, okay, I'm going to dig here. If you take that same object and you bury it at the equator, and you look at the total field anomaly, it looks like this. So it's got an opposite sign, and that's sort of the character. So it's the same object, but the signature of the field is different. And if you bury it at 45 degrees, it looks like this. Now, the thing that you can do with potential fields is the following. I could take any of these data sets that are here, and I could take their Fourier transform. If I said Fourier transform, how many people would know what it is? Right. Okay. <laughs> so we will do some processing, which just happens to be Fourier transform, but we're not going to go there. Uh, so we're going to take these data, put them through something to convert them to something else, and then we can manipulate that something else and make it come back to the same situation that it, you would have as far as data that would have been measured if everything had been vertical, if the magnetization had, had been vertical. So it's a process by which if we know that, okay, this was actually buried at the equator, we could take this image and process it such that it would be the same signature as if it had been buried at the pole. Okay? So it's just a processing technique, but it's kind of like a, a little bit of smoke and, smoke and mirrors, even though these two things look very different, I can actually convert this to that and this to that. And very often then uh, what you see on magnetic maps is that, okay, this thing has got RTP under here, which means that it, even though the data may have been taken, you know, in Brazil, they're actually, you know, interpreted as if the magnetic, inducing magnetic field had been vertically down. And that means that when you see, you know, these kind of bullseyes like that, you know that, oh, the object is directly underneath you. Because for this guy here, you know, the object is not under the high spot. And for this one here, it's not even, there is no high spot, it's a low spot. So that reduction to pole turns out to be a really, really useful processing step. And that's what this whole system does. So sometimes you'll, they'll call it, you know, instead of Fourier transform, they'll call it Fourier filtering or, or whatever, but it's just a process. So you don't need to know how that process works, you just need to know that there is a process and it's called uh, reduction to pull. Good. So that's a, that's the first thing, and that's an important thing, because then that helps you see, uh, you'll make a better relationship between the uh, image that you're seeing and any objects underneath. The next thing that I want to talk about is how to interpret simple bodies, or how to interpret the magnetization of bodies that uh, have a simple shape and are uniformly magnetized. And in particular, we're going to look at objects. So let's suppose we've let's suppose we've got something that looks like this. Let's say it's a it's a plate. 
and it's been magnetized. Here's our Earth's field. <coughs> that's, that's coming in like this. And then, of course, this thing gets magnetized in this direction. So with the magnetization is equal to kappa H naught. And what we'd like to do is to have some way of uh, characterizing what this magnetic field is, is going to be like. And we can do that. There's a very simple way of kind of thinking about things. And that brings us back to the concept of magnetic charges. So, so far we've always talked about, you know, dipoles, right? But, you know, a dipole has got, you know, kind of like a, a we can think of it as a charge at one end, a negative charge at one end, and a positive charge at another end. And that actually turns out to be useful in practice in just sort of how to think about things. So I want to take you through that. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, rats. Somehow I got switched around. It, let me just rewind just, just for a second. I, I did want to say something else about uh, uh, our, our magnets here. So if we've got a whole bunch of, of, of dipoles, then one way of also hmm. a complicating factor, what's happened here? All right. Uh, one of the things about our, our, our dipoles is that uh, we basically what we want to do is to sort of find out you know perhaps where these these things are so on our unexploded ordinance for instance uh, we had this map we clearly saw something and then we'd kind of like to know uh, <coughs> where it is but we also might like to know what its orientation was and maybe what its uh, what its strength so the Things that we're interested in are maybe the position of the dipole, depth, its orientation, and its size. So we've got uh, like a half a dozen parameters there. So if we've got a half a dozen parameters, then we can attempt to do something that's a little bit more sophisticated, and that is to try to match the observed uh, data that we obtain with something that's predicted by, let's hypothesizing, you know, a magnet that's in this direction and seeing what the, the data would be. If it doesn't fit quite well enough, we could change the orientation, the strength, the, the, the location. And so that's the idea that we've got uh, an, an object. It gives rise to something that looks like this. Now we want to do some little bit more sophisticated modeling to try to find the location of the magnet and its orientation and size, such that when we then went back and generated the data from that, that we'd get what was uh, was was matching. So here's here's an example of that. We have some data that look like that. We have an algorithm that tries to find parameters of that magnet, and this is the you know the predicted data. If we do the difference between our observed and, and predicted data, we end up with something that looks like this. So it looks a little bit choppy, but the uh, the size of these numbers is actually pretty small compared to the data. So we're actually doing not su such a bad job. And then the thing that we obtain is the depth of the ordinance item, where it is in x and y, how big it is, what its moment is, and what its what its angles are. So that actually turns out to be you know, very important information in trying to you know, really understand what's there. So that's sort of the second uh, kind of tier of, of trying to do something where you've got a few parameters and then you're trying to find out what they are to use them to characterize your object. So 
here's now where I was uh, just a second ago. Uh, I want to bring in this following concept. So we're going to introduce a magnetic charge, Q, okay? And if we have a magnetic charge, then if we have a positive charge, it radiates the fields outward that, that, that look like this. So there's a positive charge, Q, and we'd actually refer to this as a monopole. They don't exist in practice, but we can think about this as being a monopole. And that would be a positive charge. And there's actually a formula for how that magnetic field varies. It depends upon the strength of the charge. And it depends as 1 over r squared. So as I go away, so that's just like gravity, right? It's just like a mass particle. As I go away from here, the field varies as 1 over r squared. And the value of that field goes radially out. That's where the r hat is. It's got a strength Q over 4 pi r squared, and then mu naught, the permeability of free space. So that's a positive charge. That's a negative charge. They don't exist in practice. They always, poles always exist in pairs as positives and negatives. And if we look at this diagram here, I've got a positive charge and a negative charge. They're separated by a distance L. Then the magnetic moment, you know, like the strength of this magnet, is actually given by the product of that charge and the distance of separation divided by, by mu naught. So that is the magnetic moment of that, uh, that, that dipole, and the magnetic field from that dipole is something that looks like this. So it, it kind of goes, goes out from the positive pole, swings around, goes into <laughs> the, the negative pole. So it's, it's the thing that you've been drawing for the last week and a half, right? It's these, it's these dipole lines. But there is a mathematical expression that actually or quantifies for you what the magnetic field is at any point out here. And that's given by this quantity here that B is related to the strength of the magnet over R cubed. Remember we were talking about how, how the field decays away from something? So it's like <laughs> 1 over R cubed. And then we've got both an R hat and a theta hat. The sign convention is that if the magnetic moment is pointing in this direction, then there's, if you're sitting at some particular point here, then there's an angle between you and this, this axis of the dipole that has, uh, that's the theta angle. And so that is the angle that goes in, in here. And then there's your certain distance out, so that gives you how, how far out you are, your uh, radius vector. The magnetic field has got two components. It's at any particular point, it's got a component out this way and a component in this way. So it's got a, a theta component and an R component, and that's given by this, this formula here. So that tells you what the magnetic field would be like at any point uh, in the presence of a, of a magnetic dipole and also how the, the, this field uh, decays. So I, I guess as you, as you know, so these things, as I said, always are in, in pairs. How, how, and how do, how do we actually know how these things are in pairs? And what was the first experiment that anybody ever did to try to dissect these things? It, I mean, people have always wondered, okay, can I, can I actually find a magnetic pole, right? So here we've got a dipole. So how would you find a magnetic pole? What, what would be the first thing that you think about doing? Cut it in half. Cut it in half, right. So you could take this, and if you're really clever, you could take a magnet look like this. So. Yes. 
That was 13 bucks. <laughs> so it's worth it. It's worth it. So I've got. That yeah, used to be a North Pole. It used to be a South Pole, right? But now, so what actually happens here, right? So if I now take these two things, I can't put them together, right? So I must have that these two things are equal. They're, they're the same. So I haven't, in fact, managed to break them apart. I've just broken it in half, and I've got two. So I did mine. You want to do the next one? <laughs> I don't think you can do it. But you can do it. <laughs> Anybody else a real man here? Is he? <laughs> and if you grimace, oh, oh, oh. Okay, so now the Okay, so question: Have you? Have you got uh, two poles, or do you have two dipoles? Uh, two dipoles. Ah, oh, see, well. <laughs> so now you can give it to the gals just next. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could just see how far we could go. OK. Oh, sacrificing my poor man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, OK, so we can't find a pole, right? So we're only getting the dipoles. And the dipole is actually going to you know, have an expression that, that looks like this. So why, why is this useful? It's useful in the following sense. If I take, if I take any piece of, of material, okay, so it's got a lot of uh, you know, magnetic particles in it, I can actually think about these as being you know, little magnets inside, right? So that, because everything gets magnetized, so I could think about dividing this, and maybe if I do it dynamically, it's a bit better. So here's the idea. So here's my... <coughs> Here's my block, my model, whatever it is. And every part in here is going to get magnetized, right? So it's going to get mag So I've got an Earth sphere like this, so it gets magnetized down like this. Everything gets magnetized, dot, 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 right? But now if I think about it, so what's happening up here? I'm, I, I have a negative charge up here on that end of the arrow. And this end of the arrow, I've got a positive, right? And then here I've got a negative, and here I've got a positive, here I've got a negative, here I've got a positive, here I've got a negative, here I've got a positive, dot, 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 dot. You know, effectively, these guys here kind of cancel out. So I'm sitting up here, so i got these guys canceling out. These guys cancel out. Those, those, and that was positive, and that was a negative. So those cancel out, and the only thing I'm left with is some kind of negative charge up here, and a positive charge down here. So it's an equivalent way of thinking about it. Even though, it, it, truly, everything is magnetized in here, but another way of thinking about it is that you know all these internal guys are kind of canceling out, and really the only thing I'm left with is sort of like a net magnetic charge, negative charge at the top, and a net positive charge at the bottom. <laughs> Well, if that has actually happened, and we already saw what the magnetic field was from a single charge, right? Then all I'd have to do is just, you know, if I'm sitting up here, I just have to add up what's the effect of all these negative charges, and I've got the fields due to the top surface. I can do the same from the bottom, but remember, everything falls off as one over R cubed. If this thing was actually far enough down, I'm just left with something that's really close to me, and it's just all that negative charge. So there is an expression to try to figure out how much charge there is, and we'll let that value of the surface charge. So this, so this tau is the surface charge. So it's a charge per unit area. 
and it is equal to just the true magnetization. Okay, so magnetization was really to, you know kappa times H naught, right? So it's the true magnetization dotted into the unit normal. Okay. What does the dot mean? That's that projection. So you can think about this as equal to absolute m. Absolute m, this is a unit vector, so the length of the unit vector is 1. Yep. And cosine of theta, where this is the angle then between uh, the magnetization and the normal vector. In this particular case up here, I drew a a negative sign, <coughs> but if I if I thought about it as m dot m hat, so h naught is like this, so the magnetization is this way, right? And m hat is the outward normal. So m hat, as in any for any object, is always the outward normal. So m dot n is minus. And hence, that's also another way of thinking about what, what happens up here that we're going to get a ne negative charge. When we have objects like this, so let's suppose I still have a cylinder. Okay, so go back one. So if I come back here, if I just have a cylinder and I've got a magnetic field that's coming down this way, then n hat is out here, so that's negative. At the bottom, n hats out. That's in the same direction as h naught, so it's positive. So I get a positive charge here and a negative charge here. And what do I get on the side? Anybody? Zero. I get zero because n hat is out this way and m is down this way. They're at 90 degrees. Cosine theta is equal to zero. So the great thing about this concept is that I can take something that's actually pretty complicated. I can take you know, a big cylinder, chunk it in a, a field. Get, if it gets magnetized uniformly, then actually I can represent that final magnetic field just in terms of you know, a few charges on this upper surface and this lower surface. And as I said, if that lower surface goes to something that's really great, uh, at great depth, then you don't see it up in here. And that is what you're going to use on Monday when you do your team-based learning. In general, if I've got something else, if I've got a magnetic field that's coming in this way, you know, then I'm going to have you know, some negative charges here, some positive charges here. But there, I, can, I can still figure that out. Like I just calculating m dot n is not a big deal. So I just calculate that out. And then for each for each charge, right? So whenever we've got you know some kind of a charge, remember, so we had b is equal to you know mu naught over four pi r squared times q, whatever that that q was. So we could actually calculate what those magnetic fields are. Okay, so this is this leads to a, a simplification. We've got things that are magnetized uniformly, we could think about those as dipoles, and that gives us just lines of charges. Strength of those charges is m dot n hat. And then if you take a, any kind of a crazy shape in here, you could convert that just to the charges, sum up the fields from each charge, and your problem. So, on Monday, and we might have to go over th this again too, but take, take, take a look at that. This is what's going to happen. It's, so it's, it's just like at the, uh, at the beach, right? So we had a vertical rod, okay? It's magnetized in a uniform direction. We've got some radius vector A. Got a magnetization. Got a charge density. So the total charge is just going to be you know, what that charge density is, charge per unit area times the area, which means that Q is equal to you know, minus kappa h naught plus uh, 4 pi a squared. And that gives us the strength of that charge. And now once we've got the strength of, of the charge, we can calculate the magnetic anomaly over here. 
and we're good to go. Okay, so that's, this is starting to get to be a little bit more, uh, you know, realistic and, and yet still simplified ways of trying to understand what the relationship is between, you know, various bodies in the earth and what your, uh, what your field's going to be. Uh, yep. One more thing that I wanted to, to say, I think it should be kind of obvious at this point, but I just want to talk a little bit about magnetic fields from complicated objects and the effects of superposition. We've, we've implicitly been talking about that for most of the term, but I haven't actually used that term, superposition. <laughs> if we have a complicated object, then we can divide it up into a whole bunch of little prisms. Each of those prisms gets magnetized, and so we can think of it as being like its own little magnet. It's, it's just a prismatic <laughs> box here. And if we computed the magnetic response from that, it might look something like this. Okay. Now, if we take another prism, put one over here, here, another one over here, then each one of those gives rise to its own magnetic field, and they just add. So the linear superposition holds, and therefore, you know, the fields at the surface just become you know, a little bit more complicated. In the end, when we are working with really big problems, then we're just going to have a whole bunch of these little prisms, or often we call them cells, inside the Earth, each of which has got its own magnetization and which produces its own contribution to the magnetic field at, at the surface. So, yeah, just to kind of quickly, quickly go through this. So here was, here, here's now a magnetic map of, of, of a larger region. It's, it's up in Ragland. So this is this region of high magnetic magnetism here is what we're interested in. And there's a particular region up here. So that's actually where this image came from. I've shown you a number of times that, that Ragland deposit. So it's just coming in uh, in a little section in there. And there's been a background field that's been taken off. And then now we're going to use that principle of superposition and inversion and then try to get out a, uh, out a model. And this, what I've got sketched out here, is, is essentially the same kind of quantity that we talked about with the parametric uh, inversion. And that is that now we have, we have a big model. We've got lots of uh, prisms in it uh, with different susceptibilities. We try to adjust those so that we we fit the data, and we compare with the data. If we fit, we're good to go. If we don't fit, then we go back and, and we modify. And this again, we've seen. OK, I want to just sort of quickly go through a couple of applications. <clears throat> so let's just kind of rewind back to where we started a couple of weeks ago for the general use of, of geophysics. So we've got, first of all, our problem, scientific, engineering, whatever. We figure out what our physical property is. We go through, we do our geophysics, decide on what our survey is, our data, our processing, inversion. Now we come back, so that's in terms of the physical property distribution, and now we try to figure out, okay, how is that uh, actually helping address the, the problem? Okay, so that's always the, the sequence. And we have a framework for this, and we've got a whole bunch of examples that uh, this could be applied to, and I want to just flip through a couple of these. So first of all, we're just going to see what inferences we can make just from the data. Here's one from the point of view of geology. This is terrible. You can't really see it. But you know, there's a whole bunch of trees here. 
and here's there's no trees, but I don't think you can see that. Uh, but even just looking at you know what's you know what's growing there, you, you can see like okay, this is really different from what's over here. And so you immediately look at this, and you got geology unit A, geology unit B. One of the most useful things for magnetics or for geophysical surveys uh, is magnetics. It's cheap, it's effective, it's used on a regional scale, it's used on a local target scale, it's used for prospective areas, and that's why of all of the geophysical data you'll see it's probably going to be magnetics is, is the first. And I may have shown you this before, but now you might get a bit of different insight to it. Here is a geo here's a magnetic map, and here's a geology map. Two way different things. This was obtained by you know people walking in the ground looking at outcrops. This is obtained by some airplane that's flying over with an instrument. And you immediately look at those two things and you see, oh, there's a lot of common elements here. In particular, this, this region here. So we are, wherever you're separating units, uh, you know, different rock units, if, as long as they have a different susceptibility. Uh, you should see them in here, and, and you can see where that's happening right along here. So finding contacts between different units, that's a biggie. Looking through, uh, maybe these are intrusive zones, I have no idea what, what these guys are, but I mean, again, you can see. Right? So the point about this is that a magnetic image, especially when tied with a little bit of geology, right? So if, if you've got a couple of ground-based observations, you know, let's say here and here, denoting that uh, you know this is rock unit one, this is rock unit two, then you look at this magnetic map and you have a first order extension about you know where these different uh, different units are. And that might be just hugely valuable. That might actually impact where you go mapping too for that matter. Then we've got uh, faults that, that are that are coming through. So here, geologically, is a fault that has has been mapped, and very often on a fault, there's alteration that's going on, uh, various things that are happening to change magnetic susceptibility. And if you look on this magnetic map, you can see it. I mean, it's just you know, extremely clear here that there's something happening between the, these two sides. So mapping faults, mapping rock units, those are important. Uh, another one, this was iron ore. So again, just trying to find out, you know, where the iron ore is. We've got faults in here, this large region in there, uh, extremely useful. The other thing that you'll see about magnetic maps is that they not only plot the magnetic map, but they'll sometimes do processing to it. I talk about one processing step where they do reduction to pull, but there's other things that, that you can do. And you can just kind of regard these things as images. <coughs> uh, we could talk about this. That's a Landsat image. Uh, that's, this is the topography, and this is the surface geology. So we see definitely some different, uh, different rock units there. And so we can look at a number of things here. So superimpose the black lines of the, of the geology. Uh, this is the magnetic map. And you, know, you, you, you can see like, okay, there's lots of interesting things that are going on that's kind of correlating the geophysics with the geology. But if I do other kinds of processing to it, for instance, to look, at first vertical derivatives, and what that means, <clears throat> I'm looking at how the magnetic field changes uh, with, with with height. If I'm at a particular, well, I'm at a particular case. I'm, I'm looking to see how it changes uh, with height, how quickly it falls off. And if you've got if you've got something that's very near surface, 
and then you look at the gradient, you find, oh, it's changing very rapidly. If you've got something that's very deeper, then it doesn't change, change very much. So it gives you another picture, and every picture, especially when you look at it, it's got, you know, it's got some correlation to it. It's got some texture. It's, it's got, you know, you can see things happening, right? So all of those are somehow being related to, to geology, uh, and they can actually help kind of refine, you know, what it is you think you might be looking for and where to find more of it. And then you can also do other imaging, too. This is looking at uh, sort of angular dispersion. So my, my only point I wanted to make there, and we, we don't have time to talk about these things, but you will see magnetic maps, and then there will be processing that's done on Some of the processing, reduction to pole, first derivative, could be vertical derivative, could be horizontal derivative, anything. So look down at the scale and see what they're doing. <clears throat> Anytime you're taking a derivative, you're kind of looking at changes, either with respect to elevation or horizontal. Thanks. Uh, oh. Okay. Let me just, I, I just want to get this in at least within a couple of minutes, because it's such a, it's such an important problem. And we, we don't see it, we see it something to an extent in North America, but it's, I was just talking to a whole bunch of uh, people from Europe over the, this last week, and just the, the prevalence of scale of unexploded ordnance there and, and what it's causing, it, it's just huge. But I don't know that you're aware of just what things are like just in the proving grounds in the United States. Each of these little dots is a proving ground, which means this is where they train all of these guys that are going over to you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, all, all, all of these places. Each one of these is an area in which there have been just zillions of practice shots provided. And as I told you before, maybe only 90% of these things actually explode so that you've got places here that need to be built up or cleaned up. And, and check this area in here. That's like, this is San Francisco Bay Area, right? Port Ord is one of those places. You have to, have to clean it up. So there's in Central Lowry Bay Range. Here was the Fort Ord. So it's uh, that worked on, on that. Uh, places in Hawaii, Kehoalawe, it's uh, sacred ground to the native Hawaiians, needs to be cleaned up. Uh, sometimes there's just fragments, sometimes it's all kinds of junk. And I showed you that one before, that was limestone hills in Montana. And the way they used to do it was you know, these sort of handheld instruments. Now we're doing uh, digital work. And Again, I showed you some examples of uh, just like really high quality work. But, so here's something that's got a high signal to noise ratio, but sometimes you know the data are a little bit crappier. So here's a little bit, a little bit worse. And you know here's something else. It's you know things that are kind of coming in, but you can still see it. And then here you get places where okay, what's going on here? There is something buried in here, but now there's so much noise. So you get. Things are not always textbook examples, right? There's always different challenges depending upon how deeply the ordinance is buried and, uh, yeah, what it is you're looking for. And, okay, so I got to quit. Uh, the rest of the things are in the notes. <laughs> so, uh, maybe, maybe Monday I might have a bit of time to just, there's about 10 more minutes here of just, kind of taking you through a few examples. We've actually done all the things that we really need to get done. Uh, the only things we haven't seen are just a couple of applications. And, uh, you know, we'll try to sneak some time in to, to do that. The thing I want to make sure that you do this weekend is uh, go through the TBL, okay? And also make sure that you work with the app. I'd like very much for you to work with the app, build build this guy here, 
Okay, so here's 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 your homework. So use the app, build, build something that, that looks like this, right? Put a magnetic field on it that's pointing vertically down, and go through the computations that I just provided you on the board, and they are also in the GPG, to think about this scenario and figure out, okay, what is the charge density? What's the magnetic charge density on the surface? What's the total charge? Okay, and now think about, okay, there's that total charge Q. If I'm going to do a magnetic uh, experiment over top of it, this is what I'm going to get. And then importantly, look at this half width here and compare that with the depth of burial. And by the depth of burial, we actually mean the depth between the sensor height and where the top of this guy is. So if your sensor height is really at zero and this guy is at three meters, then that's the depth of burial. And then you should get that this half width is kind of in the order of that. So this is going to be the real ticket thing that you're going to do for the TBL because you're there's going to be a whole bunch of examples here where they've gone over, they've looked for, and they'll, they'll talk about, you know, I'm going to go out and find a monopole. So, like, where does that come? We've already decided you can't find a monopole, right? But they're, they're kind of an equivalent monopole because they're doing something like this, and effectively this is just a, a charge here. The, the opposite charge is way down at, at the other end. So they're going to be looking for monopoles, the depth of burial, which is what they, and that's all they want. There's these old pipes that are causing serious contamination. They want to find these things. And you know how hard it is to find them by digging, right? Because you weren't very successful. Uh, so you're, you're going to do this geophysical work over here. You're going to locate where the pipe is. And with the half width, you're going to get approximately the depth of burial. You're good to go. So work through all of that. It'll consolidate the material that we've just done in class. It'll really make the TBL go quickly, and you'll have the uh, thought process ahead. There's one, um, oh, okay. one instruction. I'll update the website today if you guys want to download it so that I'll be able to do it.